to the Prepared Mindset Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Austin, and this week we are taking a, a break from some of our regularly scheduled programming, if you will, to focus on something that is an adjacent skill set, something that you're starting to see more focus on in our community, but still not enough. <clears throat> I'm joined by Josh this week. You guys might know him better as Nomadic Clinician on the uh, the Instagrams. Uh, and we're going to talk about medical skills, medical knowledge, IFACs, right? Critical care, TCCC, stop the bleed, all that good stuff, right? This has become a lot more important in the last couple of years. And I say more important because it's being publicly recognized. It has always been important, but it's perceived as being more important the last couple of years as we're seeing more attention directed on these skill sets, this this gear, you know, IFAX, the the contents, the quality of those contents, all that good stuff. If you guys are somebody who's taken one of these classes before, you know that there's a lot of uh, snake oil out there in terms of cheaper tourniquets or certain brands of chest seals and things like that. And there's also a lot of guys that'll tell you, you need a whole lot of stuff to be effective and some that, you know, whatever. So, uh, Josh and I have a really awesome discussion getting into the contents of your IFAC, uh, where to position it on your kit. You know, we talk about that a little bit. Uh, we talk about the contents and each one kind of get into why it's important, what to look for, things like that. Now, before we get into that, we're going to hit on our sponsors here at The Repaired Mindset. First up, EclipseHolsters.com. Guys, if you carry a gun, you need to have a good holster, all right? Just like you need to have a first aid kit with you or an IFAC, you need to have a good holster for your gun, all right? EclipseHolsters.com hooked you guys up the discount code Prepared Mindset. It's going to save you 20% off your order. Spend over $100. dollars you can get upgraded to free FedEx two-day shipping, especially coming into the holidays here. They have a big sale coming up for Black Friday. Guys, pick up a holster. Carry confidently. We're talking in this episode about medical. They make tourniquet carriers. If you want something that you can carry discreetly with you, maybe inside the waistband, right? Send them a message. I know they have some options on the site. Send them a message. You can get their tourniquet carrier that fits all varieties, you know, cat tourniquets, whatever. You can get them with an Alta clip on there. You can get them with a discrete carry concepts clip. Maybe you carry your your extra gear in a Vertex bag or, or some kind of sling bag like I do. You can get it with Velcro. So it's flat on one side and it adheres with Velcro and you can carry your tourniquet and protect it that way. You can have it in there securely, ready to go. Again, EclipseHolsters.com. Discount code prepared mindset's going to save you 20% off. That's Holsters, mag carriers, dump trays, core uh, core essentials, concealment belts, tourniquet carriers, all kinds of stuff on there. They got all kinds of extra little goodies and things like, you know, Nalgene bottles and things like that for the holidays. Just awesome, awesome company. The holsters have a lifetime satisfaction guarantee. So if you guys have issues with it, they will take care of you. I've told the story before, you know, I bought one for my wife as a Christmas gift. Three weeks later, she went out and bought a Glock. So we need a new holster. They exchanged it. No questions asked. Just tremendous, tremendous people to work with that make top-notch products. And they guarantee that in three business days or less, they will have it out in the mail on its way to you. So last-minute gift ideas, getting stuff ready for maybe some close friends, maybe some buddies in the group that need to upgrade on their holster, whatever it is, head over to EclipseHolsters.com. Let Jess and her team take care of you. Up next activecarrytech.com. It's fitting that this episode we're talking about first aid. Guys, Active Carry is a new sponsor here with the Prepared Mindset, and Bill and team offer a lot of great products and kits to help you with your medical needs. So whether you're looking for a full kit, you're looking for components to, to beef up a kit, maybe you have a single person set up and you're wanting to have more chest seals, more tourniquets, more whatever, so that you can be effective not only for yourself, but Maybe for you and your wife, maybe for you and your kids, whatever the case may be. Head over to activecarrytech.com. You can use discount code PMP10 to save you 10% off your order. And there's a ton of options there. So whether you need something, like I said, for multiple people or a single person, they have an option for you. Josh and I actually get into the pieces of their blazer kit, 
which Bill sent out to me to check out. We go through each one of those items that's in that kit, talk about why it's important to have this and what you should look for. You know, Active Carry does a great job putting these kits together for you guys. Head over again, it's Active Carry TEC. Dot com discount code PMP10 is going to save you 10% off your order. Guys, if you carry a gun, if you're picking up a holster from Eclipse, you're carrying a gun, you're carrying the ability to create holes in somebody, you need to have the, the proper supplies and skills to patch those holes and to be effective in saving lives as much as you are in potentially taking them. So head over to activecarrytech.com. One last time here, PMP10 is going to save you 10% off your order. Get the tools you need to be effective when tragedy strikes. And lastly, larplabs.com. Guys, if you're looking into trying to camouflage your rifle setup, maybe you're not sure if painting it is correct. Maybe you just want to change up your look. Maybe you got a used optic that works really well, but it's just beat to shit. Larplabs.com can help. John and team do great, great work. All right. They make vinyl stickers that cover your optic, your flashlight, and they are they're computer cut, right? And this is the the good vinyl. This is the stuff they use on rock crawlers. So it's super durable. And honestly, if you're not big on painting your gun, you're not big on painting your optic, come pick some of these vinyls up. I know they got Black Friday sales coming up and they also hooked us up with the code prepared mindset, all lowercase, all one word, to save 10% off. You know, like I said, if you're thinking about painting, maybe you're a little apprehensive or, hey, maybe your state, much like the great mitten state that I live in here up in Michigan, right, our, <laughs> our weather changes week to week. Some weeks it's very white and brown and very snowy and the next week it can be, you know, very green and it, it goes back and forth so quickly, right? Vinyl decals like this, great, great way to change things up without having to spray the gun down, paint it, let it dry, you know, two days to, to spray and cure and everything. And then, you know, uh, maybe a week and a half later, you got to go back again if you're really concerned about it. So head over to larplabs.com, check out what they got. You know, they, they covered my, uh, Streamlight lights, my EOTech. They've got all kinds of popular models on there. And I know they're working on rolling out more as time is going on. Great company, makes really, really good products. Again, larplabs.com, our discount code, prepared mindset, all one word in lowercase is going to save you 10% off your order. And as we get closer to Black Friday here, there is going to be the uh, the sales coming, you know, that's going to stack with some of these discount codes. So if you see a handful that you want on the site, you want to check out, you know, get a couple for each one of your lights, each one of your optics, you know, save a couple bucks, keep an eye out. Again, prepared mindset, save you 10% off. But all right, that's our sponsors. Guys, we're super blessed to have great sponsors here. And, you know, with the holidays coming up, I implore you guys to watch out, check out the Black Friday sales, pick up things that are going to put you in a better position to be successful, enable you to be safer, more confident, and more capable. So check those out, help support the prepared mindset and some, some just awesome small businesses out there doing the good work. But... Now, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to bounce this on over to my conversation with Josh. He is a, again, he's a paramedic. He's one of the cadre members at Orion Training Group. If you guys are at all familiar with Orion, obviously we've had Jared on, we've had Jason on, we've had Blake on twice now, uh, Burke. You know, it's a great group of guys doing a lot of really great work teaching people like you and I, you know, filthy civilians, uh, how to be better with things like CQB, small unit tactics. And now, you know, Josh is one of their cadre that teaches medical, whether it's fundamental skills, they have an advanced class. Josh and I have a really, really good discussion. We talk about all kinds of things, uh, gear kit, accessibility, uh, fundamental skills and the development of those skills. Uh, we get into things like TCCC versus TECC versus Stop the Bleed and just some clarification and additional information around that. Uh, and, you know, different scenario based training, all kinds of stuff, really, really good information that if if you're carrying this kind of equipment in your kit and you should be carrying an IFAC, if not two on your gear, this is going to be stuff that's going to help you understand why you need to carry it, why it's important. So here we go. I'm going to jump on over to my conversation with Josh or, as you may know him, Nomadic Clinician. Here we go. Hey, Josh. How you doing, man? Uh, I'm doing great, man. How are you? Good. Welcome to the pod. Hey, thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, I 
I'm, this is something I am, I try to use the word, I, I, I use the word excited too much when I, you know, uh, when I define my feelings about having certain guests on and stuff, but I am excited because m- medical training and knowledge is something, obviously it's, it's your wheelhouse, but I feel like it's something that a lot of dudes or, you know, I should say folks, because not just dudes, <laughs> there's right. chicks out there that, that they train a lot in shooting and all and, and tactics and stuff, which is awesome. But I feel like the med stuff is super overlooked, both from a equipment standpoint and obviously def- I mean, a knowledge standpoint, right? Because um, if they had the knowledge, they probably would have the equipment understanding right. the importance. But uh, so that's, you know, that's where you come in, because um, I know you, you do a plethora of different things and uh, I'm eager to hear uh, whatever it is you have to share. You know, um, do you want to just start? Let's start off. If you want to introduce yourself and maybe tell the listeners a bit about, uh, you know, who you are and what you do. Okay. Um, yeah. So, you know, my name is Josh. I have an IG or Instagram account that is Nomadic Clinician. I am a working paramedic. Um, I work 911 in critical care, mostly on travel and contract work now. Um, I have a military background with the Air Force. Nothing super exciting there, and I teach um, like trauma and first aid for the most part, um, kind of around that uh, TECC realm with a company called Orion Training Group. Yeah, man, and we've had some other dudes on from Orion, and I think it's really neat the way that that Jared has kind of assembled sort of this. Uh, it's kind of like a motley crew of dudes that have. Uh, you know, like ex- expertise from all all sorts of walks and avenues, and I think in about uh, it's been like a year, two two years, I think. I think right you guys, two years. Been, yeah, taken off to a point where you're kind of starting to become one of those names that gets mentioned a lot in training, you know, and not just hey man, you want to learn how to shoot? Go check these guys out. Like hey, do you want to like learn? Period go check out Orion because of things like what you offer, right? There's more to it than just pulling triggers, which, you know, Hey, uh, we all love to shoot, right? Absolutely. <clears throat> but yeah. More to it. Um, so how did, I mean, I guess how, how did you get involved with all that? Um, so kind of just being in the right place at the right time on my part, I guess I, um, if I, if you're familiar with the account, Brian, the medic, um, Brian is actually, was actually the medical instructor for, uh, Orion training group. And he asked me to come in as a paramedic so that we could teach more advanced skills. Um, basically they needed somebody. I have, uh, I've taught with Brian through his EM, uh, e- EMT program, in the past. And then um, I think he actually did my concealed carry permit training back in the day. And yeah, so he threw my name out there to Jared. Jared gave me a call. We talked for a little bit and um, went and kind of assistant instructed a class. And that was all, that was all she wrote. Been going for about a year and a half. Um, And then the company's been going for two years. I came in a little bit after the beginning, I think. And yeah, it's been, um, like you said, it's been it's been really interesting to watch how quickly this whole thing has kind of just like blown up, right? Like, um, oh yeah, out of nowhere, it's 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 definitely something really cool to see. Like, so many people are just getting just just so much training across the board um, from this random group of individuals that have that have come together to share their knowledge, more or less. Yeah. No. And uh, it's unique in that it, it almost seems like everybody. Um, not everyone, but a lot of guys had like their own training company and it's, you know, like this whole synergistic relationship to kind of put things together. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's awesome that there is access in one, one, co- and I know there's others that do it, but you guys have access to things like the medical piece, right? Um, was, I mean, was teaching something that you were thinking about doing or like it was on the 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 game plan for you or did this kind of just really fall in your lap and become just awesome opportunity it's uh it's it's a little bit of both like i have just 
enamored with being able to share knowledge and like see that growth in people. And I was, um, I was working as a field training officer with my ambulance service. So I was, I was getting the paramedic students and EMT students um, during their field time to, to do hands-on training. I had been working as an adjunct or assistant instructor with Brian helping, helping teach his EMTs. And I, like, I absolutely love that part because you get to see like the excitement of these new people learning this fresh thing for the first time. And I got the opportunity to do it. And then I get this chance to teach people who have like zero medical background, as opposed to somebody who already, already has some. And you, uh, you, get, you get these, like, you know, I hate to use the term civilians because it, I know it's carried <laughs> it carries well, such a shitty connotation with it. Right. Um, Whether it's meant or not, it's usually so not like, like, like lay people, I guess maybe, or like, uh, yes, yeah, just people who haven't had this kind of training before and yeah. you get them coming in and you're, you're teaching them something and you see how much it actually means to them that they've, they've got something that they can take away and they have a chance of using. And it's, it's, it's a really great feeling. Um, so yeah, it wasn't, particularly in my plans initially but as i've got more into it i have discovered like a complete love for being able to pass on information that that i've gained over time no i mean i I get it um you know i well i mean i teach music so completely unrelated but i totally get what you're talking about it's like when you see the lights start to come on or people start to enjoy what they're doing um it is a really cool feeling to be in that role uh so in that in that position what is it? I mean, what are some of the things that you're encountering with students? Because I feel like there's this general misconception uh, that, especially in the two A space, right? Mm-hmm. If you slap a tourniquet or two tourniquets on your kit, you are good to go, and that will solve ninety percent of life's problems uh, in and around a gunfight. Right. And you know, uh, and that's it, you know, if a blowout kit isn't really needed or, uh, you know, it just takes up space or I don't know how to do that stuff anyway. So I have it. What's been, you know, what, what have you been running into? Um, man, we get people from all walks of life. I mean, my, my, the last class I, I, I had, I had a cardiologist, like a doctor, uh, in there we had some patrol guys from wait from, hold on a cardiologist so a guy who's been through medical school yeah he's, would, yeah you would assume went through like uh i mean i'm basing this off tv like an er <laughs> rotation all of that and he he came to a class to learn from you guys yeah he's uh he had he graduated from med school like early 90s late 80s or something like that and he uh he's been doing nothing but like office cardiology consults and um oh, wow. surgery for the past you know, 15, 20 years. So that's what he was saying when he came to the class. He's like, yeah, man, I, I, he works as a medical director for his local sheriff's department as their SWAT doc. And he's like, I have, like, I'm so far removed from the hands-on stuff that I wanted to come out and just get like a fresh perspective on what's going on in like this realm. Uh, so like, that was really cool. We had a doc awesome. come out and, um, you know, we have um, standard patrol guys from the PD who come out, most of them will carry at least a tourniquet on their belt, hopefully. Um, and then their IFAT is like stashed in their, ve- in, in their vehicle sometimes. And then we have, you know, a lot of our classes are full of people who don't work in a role where they, they carry it unprofessionally. They may carry it concealed or something like that. So I think it's eye-opening for them as to like how much kit and stuff they actually would need to treat then and there. And that's, that's what a lot of the courses offer, right? Is, is, what area or when to do what right when to when to keep fighting or when to start treating and i think it, i think it is eye-opening for these people who just slap the tourniquet on their kit and keep and go about their day like it's normal because you know or even even the guys we have a lot of people come through that have an ifac um and they'll pull it out and it's still like completely vacuum sealed in the plastic yeah. that it came in and everything else. And, yep. you know, so you, you can start making that a teaching point. Like I have, I have kits like that. So you're, you say, all right, we'll use that. And you, you start getting some fake blood involved. And once they try to start opening that stuff and see how slippery everything actually is, you kind of get some of those teaching points in. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, I think it's an eye open experience for everybody that comes through, but we don't really run into a lot of like terrible, terrible stuff. Um, I've had, recently we had a person come through and there you know there they had a uh 
supposed Cat Gen 7 on their kit. We got to looking at it, and it was just a knockoff. You know, it's a Jeez. fate turn kit, so run into Dude, that. That, is, that that shit there absolutely kills me, because yeah. guys will go out, and they will spend <clears throat> $500 on just, like, on just like a, a slide for their Glock, right? Right. Or, you know, drop two grand on uh, an optic for their rifle. And and you should, right? Because mm-hmm. those things are important. And then you get to things that are actual life-saving, uh, let's say apparatus, right? So right. in a lot of instances, it's like armor, you know, so plates or something. But then the easiest thing to pick up, right? A, a, a freaking tourniquet. Right. <laughs> and guys are like, well, I could spend $30 on this North American Rescue Cat, you know, Gen 7, whatever. Or there's this other one that looks the same. I They're $10 a piece. I'm going to buy three of those. Right. And it's like, do you do you think for a minute that maybe there's a reason why these are priced so far apart? Yeah, this poor guy, he had actually got them from uh, like one of the online like ammo companies or something. Like some, They had like a special going on. They were like, buy these three turner kits for like 50 bots or whatever and um i think they were marketed as like a gen sits or like an older cat and yeah sure enough that one was fake and he brought the others in that day. i was like no man they're they're all fake like i I don't know what to tell you i'm sorry about that like i gave him a uh i gave him a cat seven out of my kit so he had at least like one good one but i was like i'm just gonna take this fake one that you have like this is gonna be a training turn kit now um it sucks that we have a uh that and the rats you see a rats every once in a while and you just try to convince those guys that like mm, i don't this shouldn't be your mainline tourniquet so, and that was something i was going to ask you about because there are companies out there that will build kits and because how easy it is to uh include those in the the zip up pouch and everything because they're the size of like a baby's fist or whatever <laughs> um they're like oh yeah it comes with a tourniquet and then like we order the kit and it's like well it's a rat tourniquet so do, right. are those because I've heard people say they're good for like dogs and stuff or children with small extremities. Is that true or is it really not? I wouldn't use it. Um, I've heard people say that it's good for dogs. Um, for everything I've taken on canines, uh, you, they, nobody in any of the courses has ever talked about the rats really, but it's been like one class. So uh, my knowledge on canine is not like, probably as deep as it should be as far as kids go i wouldn't use it on a kid either uh if it's if if the limb gets too small to where you can't put like an actual tourniquet on it you're probably good to just use pressure at that point and you can hold that pressure long enough for it to uh get bandaged or whatever else it's just i i haven't seen any data um from the rats with it being such a narrow band and everything else that says it would really stop the bleeding it was the same reason people carried swat t's for so long right um is that they're they pat down really flat and they're easy to easy to carry places it's just all of those like elastic type turn, tourniquets they don't have a lot of yeah. good data backing them up well and that's you can find on amazon as well and i he, he, you you buy what they call like first aid kits and you look through the contents list right and like oh it includes a tourniquet and like that's they give you basically like a strip of like surgical rubber or yep. elastic or something like oh this is your tourniquet and I remember going through it with my wife when we bought one for around the house, just like that band-aids and, you know, your ouch pouch stuff. And she goes, yeah, here, this is the tourniquet. And I was like, I I don't even know, a, like, a self-respecting drug addict that would tie off with this. Like, this is <laughs> awful. You know what I mean? Like, they're just, they're not good. And people don't know. You know what right. I mean? Like, they just think that's acceptable. Or that, oh, it's fine. I'll just use my belt. Because I saw right. that in the movie. And it's yeah, like. Yeah. Nope, I don't think you understand. It's I guess, not, like, uh, um, you know, belt works really great if, if you want to shoot up or something. Not that I would recommend doing that, but um, <laughs> yeah, I don't. I wouldn't use it to like stop bleeding unless you know, um, improvised tourniquets have a place if you have nothing else on you. Uh, mm-hmm. Not, not, not the way to make one, probably. Um, yeah, I, I bought one of those like little kits recently as like an example. It was. Um, I was at Academy getting camping stuff and I was like, Oh, there's a first aid kit. Like what's in it. And it was literally like a SWAT tourniquet and some random pressure dressing. And that was the entire like bleed kit first aid thing they had going on. Um, normally I do like the same thing for around the house is buy something that has a lot of like boo boo kit, ouch pouch type mm-hmm. stuff in it because that's, that's most of what I'm going to use. Right. Um, but yeah, I don't, 
there's no like a last advance unless like um I know we had kind of touched on it before, like with the SWAT tees or um the one you got recently. Like if I need to make a pressure dressing or I need something that's not like major bleeding, but it's moderate bleeding, that I think I, I can control with pressure. Yeah. So yeah, okay. So you're talking about the uh, the Slishman pressure, yeah, yeah, which yeah. applies in almost the same manner as a cat, which is kind of what I like about it, because like you can teach somebody that general process for each one of those. You know what I mean? So it's like one skill set. So, <clears throat> and that was part of our conversation too. So what, if we can for a second, what is the 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 separate uses for a pressure bandage or a pressure mm-hmm. wrap? And I mean, obviously a tourniquet is to stop circulation to halt bleeding. Right. I mean, in simplest terms. So a pressure wrap is, I mean, also to aid in stopping bleeding. Um, but what's, where's the difference lie with those? Um, so to get like a little bit more in depth with it, a tourniquet, uh, when I think of a tourniquet, I think of major bleeding, um, I don't know if we're if we're if we're cursing on here or not, but usually the term you, I use you is, say whatever the fuck you want. Okay. Like, totally not with the, <laughs> um, the uh the term I would usually use in tours is like like if it's oh shit bleeding, right? Yeah. If it's if you're looking at it, you're like that's 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 a lot of blood coming out all at once, <laughs> like, and it's it's a limb where it's applicable to, to put a tourniquet on, put a tourniquet on it, right? Now, like in EMS or like like going through EMT and paramedic school you get taught that tourniquets are for arterial bleeding. So our, our, our thing is bright red spurting blood, right? Cause that's, that's what the tourniquet does is it cuts off blood flow in the artery. That's why it has to be so tight. So we can compress mm-hmm. that muscle um, over the artery with that. That's pretty much the realm that I keep a tourniquet in, right? Tourniquets like, Oh shit, major bleeding. Like, and if it's spurting um, I, when I train, like lay people or whatnot we I, I i normally stick with if it looks like a lot of blood put a tourniquet on medical people will f- figure that out later right yeah. um, for, for pressure dressings like mild to moderate bleeding so if it's if it doesn't look like it really needs a tourniquet applied to it like it's not like gershing out blood the entire time you know you can put that pressure on it and it kind of slows you're still gonna have to hold pressure and that's what a pressure dressing is great at is you can you can pull it back on there and the only thing with it is you have to keep checking that, make sure it's not coming through or anything. So I would I would say pressure dressings are really good for areas like that where it's a little bit less bleeding, like on the arms, stuff like that. If you can't pack it, um, I would I would still use wound packing, which we can touch on as well, uh, to areas that you can pack in the joints or you know in the arms as well. If you can't uh, arms, legs, limbs, if you can't put a tourniquet on, if you don't need to put a tourniquet on, or if you're converting the tourniquet. So if you uh, have had a tourniquet on for a while and you need to downgrade that, you can you can pack or add a pressure dressing pack or pack and add a pressure dressing. Um, so then, so both of those should be and so and like we like we talked a couple of days ago about <clears throat> that pressure dressing. This is all stuff that was included in one of the the IFACs that that I got and am keeping with my kit. So with a basic with a basic IFAC or individual first aid kit, right? The keyword there for people listening, individual, this is designed to treat one person, maybe two, if you get lucky, right? Um, so now we just touched on a tourniquet and the pressure dressing with the pressure dressing. That's there's a couple different things out there, right? I mean, like the Slishman we just talked about, but a lot of times you see things like an Israeli bandage, um, which works in kind of a similar fashion. I don't love those because I don't like the little plastic clip, um, but they're on Amazon and they're cheap. And I feel like a lot of guys throw them in their kit because like, Ooh, the Israelis, they know what's up. They fight a lot. Yep. I could be totally um, wrong. <laughs> no, there's, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's like anything else you get into in, in any industry. Like there's, there's different brands of it all. Right. Um, North American rescue mates, several variations of pressure dressings. I like the, um, I'll probably butcher the name. It's the, um, Olus or, Oleus, it's uh O L A E S. Yeah. 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 Uh I know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Tat Med Solutions makes it. Right. Um, I like it. It has a it has a really big big uh pad on it as well. So there's a lot of uh area there to actually apply it. It applies 
in my mind, it, it's it, it, it applies easier than like the Israeli. The, the Israeli is what we were issued in the military, right? It has that big plastic clip on it. Like you have to put it through and pull it back. It works great for applying pressure. That clip can be kind of bulky it's weird. sometimes. It, yeah. Um, some of those companies, I know North American Rescue does like kind of like the Schlishman. It um, includes Velcro like throughout the dressing. So as you're going, oh, yeah. it, it uh, secures itself as well. But yeah, there's a yeah, lot of them. Uh, a really good example of military grade air quotes, right? Not oh, yeah, yeah. necessarily meaning that it's the the best option out there. It no, just, just the, uh, it was either really cheap or really durable, and hopefully sometimes both. Right, right. It's the uh, cheapest bidder, right? For the pretty most, much. yeah. Um, but yeah, there's lots of like lots of stuff like that, and that's a, it's funny that you mentioned like the uh, the IFAC being like an individual item. Right, because you get that a lot too. They're like, "Oh, what do you have for medical? Like on your kit? Like I have an IFAC. Like okay, that's that's enough for you or one person, mm-hmm. right? That was that was the original idea behind the IFAC. I think we've kind of we've kind of changed that terminology over time, where your IFAC just refers to your medical supplies, right? Versus yeah. um, it being like just just for you. Because the way I was trained is if I if if I have to come treat you, I'm gonna work out of your IFAC, right? Whatever you have on you, that's what I'm working out of. And then I still have my kit in case I need it for something else. Right. Um, versus somebody who's filling like a medic role or medic or uh, you know SWAT medic or whatever. You are gonna have way more stuff on you because you're supplying yourself and then you're probably gonna need to have some backups to supply your team and everything else with it. Yeah. And you're starting to see, I think more people adopt that. Well, it's not really adopt the mindset, but understand what you just said, right? Where whatever's mounted on your belt or wherever you have your IFAC, that's, that's for somebody to render aid onto you. Right. right? Um, <clears throat> and then things like uh, on a plate carrier, right? Like a dangler, like in mine, I run, I have a, like a second IFAC and then some, um, it's a lot of gauze, you know, right. just because I don't think people realize how quickly you can end up going through gauze uh, right. if something bad happens. So gauze, uh, here's another one, uh, a chest seal, which I don't know a ton about applying, but on the off chance, somebody else is with me that does like mm-hmm. probably worth having. Um, what are, what kind I mean, I feel like a lot of people think chest seal and I think you just automatically go to like sucking chest wound or something. But it, it, in your opinion, is that something that somebody needs to have in a basic first aid kit? Um, so semantics, but we'll clarify as far as um, like basic first aid kit around the house. Maybe, you know, you, you might you might need a, a chest seal. Um, yeah, I, should have like, I meant a basic first like an IFAC. Right. right. I mean, <laughs> still, I I would include it in the IFAC because. If, if we're if we're thinking in that realm, we're thinking like penetrating trauma, right? And mm-hmm. so, um, for that, chest seal works great. Now, <clears throat> when you mentioned like sucking chest wounds, I think that's a uh, like a good teaching point for a lot of people is that like chest seals are for sucking chest wounds. Um, I know there's some contention out there with it, but trying to lean into chest seals being applied only for for sucking chest wounds so if it's in like if it's in the abdominal like or area it's penetrating trauma like yeah you want to you want to bandage it you want to seal seal it in a way but you don't really need to like throw a chest seal on that chest seals don't stop bleeding they stop air from getting into that cavity um speaking from experience it um will still bleed like especially your vented chest seals they will uh still let blood come out so i would i would definitely apply like just for a sucking chest wound and um if you're not or any anybody listening isn't familiar with like what a sucking chest wound is or what it looks like there's um some great videos on youtube that give uh examples of them that's i would i would definitely say it's an important piece of kit and I like that you said that you have a lot of gauze in your in your uh, dangler because that's one thing I do as well. It's it's such a versatile thing to have. Um, when it's you get cheap in, too. It's cheap. They're like twenty cent rolls on Amazon, right? Okay. Like, and and gauze isn't one of those things that's like, oh, you have to have like this type of gauze. Like, if you have something that's like maintaining its sterility, you're good, and yep. you can use it for minor stuff. It can be used. It's just versatile. You can kind of get MacGyver with it and use it for whatever you want. Um, I pack 
extra extra just normal roll gauze in all of my stuff all the time as well yeah no and i think uh there's a video i, th- I think it was jason it might have been jared but it was an orion video when they were going through like their play carrier setup and he's got like his big old general per- uh general per- purpose pouch on his cummerbund and he's like i think it, it zip it, it it unzips and opens to the bottom he's like in this here this is just gauze like this right. whole thing is just gauze. <laughs> yeah. like if any of you guys have ever been around this like you understand like and and that's one of the things I I know when people are building out first aid kits, whether it's a company building them to sell them or an individual building it out to have it, your your real estate is a premium. You don't want to have like this huge honking thing if you can avoid it, unless that's your role, right? But like, man, <clears throat> I don't think I've found I mean, maybe a couple ones, but like for the most part, you can't really have enough gauze. You know, it's you're you're probably gonna use everything you have in there if you get to an event or an emergency where you have to use gauze, you're probably going to use all of it. Right. Like it's, you're going to need all of that. Um, and guys are like, eh, you know, like I, I feel like sometimes when you go through and you're trying to slim stuff down, especially some of these like really yeah. popular kits, that go on belts now like, Oh yeah, it's so uncomfortable on my lower back. So I got this slim kit, but all my shit doesn't fit in here now. So what am I going to take out? And it's like, Oh, I'll just take out this gauze. I have like eight of these. I don't need, you know, I'll, I'll put two in here, you yeah. know? And it's like, mm, I mean, I get it. But like maybe don't get rid of it. Maybe just like put it into a different pocket or something, or like put it in a backpack if you already have it, always have it with you or something. Right. Yeah. I, I think you're right. Though it's, it's really like role dependent as well. But I wouldn't. Uh, I definitely wouldn't take the gauze out of my kit. Like two rolls is probably not. It's it's you know it, it'll get you there um, if you have to pack a wound. But in in our roles as everyday people. Right. Like, what are we going to re- be responding to where somebody has just like one penetrating injury or something like that? If, if we're talking about like having to come up to this emergency, then it's 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 probably a major event with mo- like multiple casualties. Yeah. Right? Like a, a car accident or something more than right. more likely than a single gunshot wound. Right. 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 And, you know, very rarely does somebody just shoot one time. They make you hit one time. <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> Yeah, it never works out quite that that nice. Well, I mean, sometimes, but yeah, it's uh, it, it's something you need to, I would say, have multiple sizes of and have it staged in accessible places, uh, you know, on your kit. If and that's just speaking entirely just like on what's on your body. If you have something like a backpack or something like that, like fill those extra spaces. And that nice part about gauze is it press it compresses. Like it's as long as you're not like really, you know, fucking it up or anything or, or, uh, compromising it's, um, you know, it's stability and, uh, and, you know, like ripping the container open or something or, or really just jacking it up. Right. It's really not that delicate of a thing. Um, when it's in its packaging. No, not at all. Um, you can, you can really get that anywhere. Um, I like, I don't know if you like the dangler, uh, have you had a chance to like actually play with it and like, work out of it uh i do so i'm i'm a taller guy i'm like sit well i think i'm like between six two six three i just right. went and had a biometric screening yesterday and they tried telling me i was six one <laughs> regardless i have a, a little bit of a longer torso so like with my plates on and then the the dangler for me actually like barely it doesn't even touch the the very top of my belt buckle <clears throat> so for me it's all good like i have full range of motion um, but I have a buddy who is a uh, attack P for six mm-hmm. years and he fucking hates danglers, but he's also like five, six. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, dude, I, 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 I gets in the fucking way all the time. I can't. So he, uh, he, I think he runs like a fanny pack and you'll like twist it around his waist and stuff to get it accessible or out of the way when he's moving around and shit. Yeah. Um, I have a buddy that does the, uh, the same thing. He likes the fanny pack for, um, like moving it as he needs to. I tried the dangler for a while, but I'm a very uh, like air quotes average height person. I'm like five, five, nine, five, ten on a good day. Okay. So for me, the dangler is like right over my belt. And I uh, I really wanted to start practicing with the horizontal mag that Jason and Jared and all them were using. And mm-hmm. so I went to a GP pouch on my side instead. And the GP pouch, um, not really on my side, but, you know, left more yeah, or yeah non-dominant side of 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 where my what radio and stuff would be and it's it it works out pretty well for me and but it does give me a chance to do like i, I like shove extra stuff in there and when i was looking at it i was like oh i have extra space like what else am i going to put in here it's gauze it's 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 more gauze yeah. like and i point. think 
that, you know, that's acceptable, right? Like get a GP pouch and put it where it's going to be comfortable for everything else that you're doing. I feel like in the consumer driven world today, and maybe, I don't know if you see this in class a lot, guys are like, they buy, and I say this as somebody who did buy like the T-Rex arms belt and the T-Rex arms right. like med one and everything. Um, it works for me because I do run the dangler. Like I do have enough like stuff, you know, uh, but guys are like, oh yeah, I just want the the coolest uh, you know, high speed, low drag option I can. So that little, like, uh, what is it that Pharaoh makes like the, the little like camping roll thing that like looks like oh, a little yeah, the, uh, that pulls out, um, yeah. or the a fact, you know, and I watch some of these videos and guys are like, yeah, it just deploys like this. And they're really reefing on this thing to pull out and deploy that kit. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to fight that. I mean, you'll probably be all jacked up on adrenaline, but like, I want it to be more easily accessible. That's just me. I owned one, um, the, uh, the roll one, right? Yeah, I think, um, I think, and I, I owned one. I had it on a belt and I, for, for the same reason we were just talking about, like, I didn't like it on the belt, like it's sitting in vehicles and stuff like that. It was, it's just a chunk back there. And like some people that's probably fine to deal with, um, it may work at the back of a plate carrier, but it was, it was, I, I ran into the same issue. I was having to like really like reach behind my back and like rip this thing to to get it out. I was like, this is, like this isn't just fast, and it's cool that it's all contained and folds up there. For me, I have a really bad habit, at least like in a civilian paramedic setting when I'm working out of a jump bag and stuff, to where I just make a yard sale when I'm working. Like there's stuff everywhere, you know. And yep. if I like have to pick up and go, I'm gonna forget something. Like it's bound to happen and I'd, I'd hate for that to be the thing left there so i found like the gp pouch for me you know it stays attached to me the whole time i can flip the top open everything's kind of organized how i want it in there and i can just reach through it and get what i want and the dangler is kind of the same uh, the same way you you can you can open it up you see you see what you need to grab out of it do your work you still have everything with you um, yeah. i just didn't i didn't like that one yeah i mean it's i, I kind of go about it the same way though like I, some of the nicer ones, like I think mine's from Spiritus to your Spiritus or Pharaoh, one of the two, but the, the nice ones, not the, the $20 ones on Amazon, because <clears throat> I've also owned a couple of those. Uh, <laughs> I think we all have. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, I didn't want to commit the full 50 bucks. Uh, right. I probably should have, would have saved myself the 20. It's like the wrong way to look at it. But, you know, I digress. The nice ones have like the um like elastic loops stitched into them. So you can like, yes. you know, secure stuff in there. Cause I think a, a lot of guys use it for something other than med. But right. for me, I just like, honestly, I use those to uh, like, I shove gauze rolls in those. And then I think like it's my rightmost one is where I have uh, like balled up uh, sealed like gloves. So I know okay. where my gloves are immediately. And then everything else in there, I don't really care because as soon as I zip it up, it's just going to be like, like you said, empty everything out and go to work have it there like i'm not super concerned about that so yeah. much um, that's another uh i think that's another thing people forget about putting in their stuff too right is gloves um i know when you buy an ifac normally you have those like like super awesome little rolled up one set of gloves that comes with the blue it. gloves that come in like the size of like a uh like a bag of those foam ear uh earplugs yeah 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 I, I can i can never find those inside the pouch when i want them um i ended up just like pulling gloves out of a box and putting them as a blot bag and shoving that in there somewhere so i'd have multiple pairs but i see that in class a lot too is people um like don't have gloves in their kit or whatever else and i guess if it's just you and your buddies right and you're going to be working on on them maybe maybe you're fine with that um after mm. after after being after being in ems like for five or six years whatever i i can touch anything with gloves on like like if i like if i have gloves on i'll do whatever um, I'm not, I'm not hardly touching a person that I don't know. Like if I don't have a set of gloves on, no. um, so even I, friends, I know my, yeah. I've got a couple of buddies that lived like a questionable lifestyle in their uh, <laughs> early twenties and like, right. You know, I mean, Hey, I love you, man, but, uh, let's draw the line between uh fluid contact right, here. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's definitely my line with, um, with all of that. <laughs> like, I don't, I, I, I like my friends, but I, I still don't want like to touch their blood. Uh, so when you're talking about gloves, because I think there's there's some nicer ones and there's like the cheap shitty ones, and does it really make a difference? Dude, I am frugal as like all get out. I will like I I, I go to Harbor Freight. 
and I buy the big, yeah the box of those things. Yeah, yeah, I just buy a box of gloves and I throw them in a Ziploc bag. Um, one thing about Harbor Freight that I like is you can you can get like the thicker variant of the nitrile gloves. So I'll I'll get some that are um I don't know like like eight or nine mil whatever the uh, thicker version is, mm-hmm. and you know a little bit more tear resistant. But yeah, I don't I don't go for like um the super expensive like gloves that are marketed towards that. I just it was like bare skin or something. There's yeah, yeah, yeah. Some yeah. It's like, oh yeah, these things are great. And it's like, I mean, I don't do enough with med to know, Mm-mm. but it does seem like something that I don't, I don't, I've not, I've not heard many stories of guys like, yeah, those crappy blue gloves, man, they're awful. I can't, I can't use those fucking things. Um, yeah. I mean, every once in a while we'll get like, we'll get gloves on the ambulance that are, like obviously from a cheaper supplier or something and you'll you'll go through six sets of gloves because as soon as you pull it on it it, busts. it rips right yeah and so like I, there are cheaper crappier gloves out there that's why that's why i buy a little bit thicker ones but yeah i'd rather spend like six or eight bucks for an entire box of gloves at like harbor freight or something instead of buying whatever yeah. commercial product there is and i've not had issues with those because i use those to like i put them in my med kits uh if i happen to go through a pair or something or lose them or whatever or split the the kit if i just bought a bunch of stuff um i use them for cleaning my guns honestly yeah. they're great i've not i don't want to say never but i don't they don't really rip or, or break or have any issues with those things they're actually for being harbor freight which everyone says is you know like because they are they're a lot of stuff they're the cheap shitty right. place but yeah, yeah. those gloves are not bad they're, they really aren't no they're not i keep them um in my toolbox as well like if i if i have to work on my truck or something then like i like i throw those on and like like i'm gonna rip them eventually but there's i mean they're, they're pretty tough for what they are and you know you're not spending a buttload of money that's 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 one thing i know like gear's expensive so let's save money where we can yeah. No, absolutely. And that's, you know, <clears throat> you buy a whole box. They're like, what, seven, nine bucks for the box. And that's a couple right. hundred pairs or whatever. You have stuff for your med kits. You have stuff for your your actual kit um, as well as at the house. Right. You know, so whatever you need it for around the house, cleaning your I mean, multiple applications there. Like you said, that's an easy place to save money versus going out and dropping, you know, 10 bucks here, five bucks there. It does add up. And I think if you're buying some of those more expensive ones you might you might be doing it for the wrong reasons right. I mean, all, say. <laughs> yeah and i yeah just you know let's say let's save that money we could spend that money on the uh like real tourniquets versus fake ones, right like we can we can use that to actually buy decent tourniquets at that point uh right yeah and I mean, is that i mean it's so in that regard i mean when you we talk about cheaper talking about cheaper kits and things I mean, when you guys have people show up to class, right? Mm-hmm. Short of the fake tourniquets, what kind of stuff are you seeing? Just because I, I feel like there is such like a void of knowledge. Yeah. People like, w- like w- what's a starting point, you know? Because I've looked at some of these things, like talking about money, like two hundred dollars is a lot of money for yeah. some people. So to look at that as for a medical a medical kit or an eye fact that statistically you may not use as much mm-hmm. as something else, you know. So I can understand where people try to cut corners. What are, what kind of stuff do you see people walk in the door with? Um, we pretty much see everything. A lot of times, um, depending on the students, you know, uh, we have a lot of people come to class like without anything. Um, like I said, our our classes are mixtures of law enforcement and civilians and medical personnel. A lot of uh, the people that are coming to get like um, continuing education hours uh, f- from the medical world uh, don't bring kit. They didn't, you know, it's not really like their thing, which is fine. Uh, we have, you know, we have pouches they can, they can throw in their belt or whatever. But as far as like people bringing like certain IFATs, we really don't, I can't think of any certain thing I've seen. Um, I see a lot of the like pre-sealed, pre-packaged, IFAD refill kits in, in different mm-hmm. pouches and stuff like that. I, uh, those are pretty great depending on where you get it from. Most of uh, most of the ones I've seen from reputable places have good stuff in them. As far as um, like the actual pouch they come in, it's kind of the same as like me and you talking about it. You 
you just got to find what works for you and what you're comfortable working with. Right. There's no, I, I, I don't have like a gold standard of this is, this is the IFAT you need to use. Like yeah. as long as, uh, as long as the gear inside of it's good and you can work out of it, then it's kind of a run what you run type thing, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, is it, is it safe then for most people? Um, I would assume anyways, like, start like i feel like people try to save money by piecing one together as well rather than buying one because they think it's gonna to save uh and i don't know that that's actually that's actually if you're buying if you're buying the right things right Right. most of these companies have figured that out already and like you you save i mean it may not be a ton right but pre-built kits are i would say probably the way to go you know i think so you got everything i think so i think there's a lot of um you know i've i've uh talk to some of the North American rescue reps a couple of times and those, you know, those kits, you can pretty much pick what you want to be in it. You brand it and put it out. So most of the time, you know, those kits have, have all the basics in it. You're going to get, you know, a cat turner kit or some kind of turner kit. You'll get a pressure dressing, some hyphen chest seals, and normally at least one set of gauze, gloves, and maybe some shears. Um, and that's, that's a, that's a good place to start at. Right, that that'll cover the basics for, like we were talking about, treating one casualty, and then you can kind of work from there. Um, I can't think of any like specifics off the top of my head. I know North American has the Eagle I Fats and the M Fat and a couple others. Those are all pretty much have the same stuff in them. Mm-hmm. Um, you might spend anywhere from sixty to eighty bucks, maybe down to forty. Um, depending on which kit you get, but it it includes most of the stuff you need. If you're gonna try to piece it together, you can do it. Just just like we were saying, you make sure that some of those items are reputable. So like your turn kit for itself, and then like your pressure dressing. There's there's a couple different brands you can choose whichever one, and then you go with gauze and stuff like that. You know, if it doesn't have to be a hemostatic gauze versus just normal roll gauze or anything else, as long as you realize that there is a difference with them. So if you need so to save a little. It is, it is with the hemostatic gauze. Cause I feel like people spend more money on that because just it's hemostatic. Right. And the same thing when people like freak out and like, Oh, you have to have quick clot in your, in your, your right. bag. I've also heard some people freak out and like, Oh, you should never use quick clot because it's not good for you. Is that actually true? Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think quick clot would have been, I don't think they would have been selling products for this long if it was actually bad for you. You know, um, the original like quick clot powder sucked. It was, it, it, it did its job very well. Um, it sucked for medical personnel later, later, cause it involves a lot of irrigating and debriding, making sure that you get all of that stuff out of the wound before you close it up. Right. Nowadays it's impregnated gauze and whether it's quick clot or, Cheeto gauze or whatever hemostatic gauze is out there, it's still good to have. Um, it's it's not. I wouldn't say it was bad for you. It might upset a trauma surgeon later on, but that's neither you yeah. nor your casualties' problem, right? Like no, you, I mean, at, yeah, at the time, your right. Main concern is to get the job done. Yeah, I mean, the major difference would be like, so a hemostatic gauze, depending on which one you use. If you pack with it, you only have to hold pressure for three to five minutes, depending on the type of gauze. If you pack with normal roll gauze, you're going to have to hold pressure for 10 minutes to make sure that it stopped bleeding. That's the <laughs> the standard. Um, the downside to that is that, one, we have to hold pressure for an extended amount of time. And two, the hemostatic gauze expires, right? So it, 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 it may be years away, but at some point, it's going to expire, whereas your roll gauze doesn't have doesn't really have an expiration date so if you if it's something where you want to not have to think about like removing expired items from your kit and putting putting something else in there because like you said how how often are we going to use the ifac on our kit like i'm i'm probably more likely to use the first aid kit that i keep in my vehicle to help somebody in a crash or something i might use the stuff from, from an ifac um but that hemostatic agent or hemostatic gauze might sit there for a while and I don't, I don't want to have to worry about it being inspired. So I, I have, I have it in my kit. It's good to have. Um, but again, I keep more roll draws than I do like hemostatic yeah. draws. Well, yeah. I mean, so talking about expiration dates, <clears throat> um, 
Is there anything else that we talked about? Like I'm thinking just specifically like the chest seal, does that stuff have an expiration date or, or like a shelf life that it should be observed? I would, they should have, I'd have to check one, but they should have an expiration date on them. I have um, like at work, I have open chest seals that had obviously been in storage for a long time. They are still usable. They're still, you know, they're still occlusive, but um, a lot of times the adhesive that comes on them starts to wear out or get hard over time. Yeah, uh, that's not that, good. that would be the main thing I would worry about. But again, we're talking about like years uh, that that thing had been sitting around. This was I, I, this was a, a contract job I was working in, like a very remote area that rarely got new supplies in. So this thing had been sitting for like God knows how long good long while yeah. yeah yeah the only other thing would be like your tourniquet right if your tourniquet um it depends on how much exposure it gets to elements and sun and all of that stuff i would you know rotate your tourniquets out six months to a year whatever uh if it starts to look like it needs to be replaced maybe replace it and then just you know write training on it use it for dry fire yeah i mean and and pay attention to that stuff too because i mean it, it really is something you should practice and you do a ton of practice with it, but like tourniquet application with your, your offhand, right. Mm-hmm. You, you get hit in your right arm and stuff like that. Uh, I think it's, <clears throat> I think it's, it's undervalued. You know, I think it just, because it's not like that sexy skill set where it's like, right. you know, again, coming back to tr- pulling triggers, which is great. Um, but what are you more likely to use? Probably tourniquets. I mean, honestly, right. I would, I would argue that you're probably more likely to use that because, like I said, we, we mentioned car accidents. Uh, I mean, shit, you work in the kitchen, um, yep. you know, and that it could that, that doesn't ha- it doesn't have to involve like an an assault, you know. Um, I still give my wife a hard time because I bought her a uh, like mandolin for right. the and she was making like ap- apple chips or whatever and it was too inconvenient to use the guard that came with it when she got <laughs> the apple and she like this big old slice down her hand and i'm like seriously I, I i left the house for 20 minutes like come on you know so stuff like that happens people drop knives all the time you stab yourself in the foot whatever like stuff yeah. happens chopping chopping logs and wood like you know stuff happens probably more likely to use a tourniquet than the gun that you carry around. Uh, it just isn't as you know, quote cool. Right. Right. Yeah. But I, I, not I would exactly. argue that even a life is cooler, but right. you know. <laughs> yeah, I think, that, I think the casualty would probably agree at that point too, but um, yep. yeah, medical is definitely not like as sexy as like shooting or, 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 you know, firearms are in general, but like you said, you're way more likely to use it. So I yeah, think that's, I, um, and it's Something. starting to gain some traction, yeah. you know, like and not even some, I think it's starting to gain a ton of traction because people are finally starting to talk about it. Right. Um, and yeah. have access to education, like what you guys are doing. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. Like, I, I, I love seeing like more, more of the conversation out there. Um, it's cool. Like the medical community, especially like on social media is really cool in that aspect and that like, there's not as much infighting between us you know? i'm just gonna say is there yeah. less like like dick measuring like there isn't the, like the 2a space with guys talking about like oh you did your reload wrong or right. you know or you put your stock in your shoulder versus like in the medical i would i would think in a community that's literally based off saving lives and helping right. each other you know that it, it, that is so is that a correct assumption then yeah pretty much i mean it's you, you can't really get into arguments when it's all like I mean, listen, there's, there's still arguments out there. People go back and forth about like stuff all the time. But when most of your practices are based off of evidence, you know, it's, it's like evidence-based medicine, right? Hard so it's, it's kind of hard to argue with the data at that point. Um, but no, even like, like on Instagram, most of, the, most of the medical accounts out there, we probably all know each other and we all talk on a regular basis for the most part. So like, it's just one big community that's trying to help each other for the most part and all we want to do is make sure that everybody gets the information and i think that's that's a that's an awesome shift to see and i think you're right more people are starting to catch on and kind of follow along with that yeah i think that you know the more that we see of people adopting that that more open mindset to i don't only spend money on ammo to 
or, or training on how to shoot and stuff. And I need to spend, you know, money on training for medical radio land navigation. You know what I mean? Like just getting outside the, the flat range mentality, I think is awesome. So, and in that regard, I think one of the things that people that maybe kept people away for a little bit, right. Is this like assumption that you need to be in a, to be effective with this, with these items, right. Right. You have to have like encyclopedic knowledge of the human body. Right. Yeah. You know? So where do you guys start in, in classes and things like I'm assuming that since this is, it is getting so much traction that it's probably not as difficult as, you know, a lot of people had the, the misconception that it is. I mean, certainly levels of difficulty. Right. But where do you guys start with people when you, you bring them in? I, I think um, you're right. There's levels where we start at is like we st- I start every class with the idea that nobody knows anything. Um, if there are people that have prior experience, you know, that's I, I pretty much tell them like, Hey, this might be redundant for you. We pretty much start at the very bottom. Like this is what like a major bleed is. This is, and this is what you can do for it. So we're, we're basically taking the items that we've already talked about from the IFAC, right. And we're explaining when you want to use those and then trying to get the why understood as well. So we spend a lot of hands-on time making sure that the like actual actions are understood of it all, but there's a lot of focus on being able to assess people to know what you want to do. And we keep it very simple in the fact that like, okay, like, if A, then B, right? So if you see major mm-hmm. bleeding, that equals a tourniquet. Like if it's a bleeding, if it's bleeding in like this junctional area, then that's going to be wound packing. Um, like when you say like, junctional, can you expound on that? Yeah, yeah. So junctional would be like in your in your shoulders, armpits area, right? I know I'm making like hand signals on video <laughs> for us right now, but they can't yeah. see. So like shoulder, shoulders, hips, basically where your limbs connect to your torso. Right. Okay. So that, that would be my junctional area. You can think about the neck as well a little bit. Um, there's, so we there's, do not want to apply a tourniquet to the neck. Is that, and you know, it's, it's uh, depends on how you feel about the person yeah. or um, I guess how hot their wife is. Right. I, but um, <laughs> yeah, we started like the bare minimum there and just really try to try to get everybody up to speed. And kind of like we were saying in the beginning, it's a really cool process to watch somebody go from having no idea to giving them like some idea where you're like okay so you have this type of injury and they know what to do at that point um so you start ingraining that knowledge a little bit like the classes so we touch on anatomy and physiology of the body um at a very basic level um if we do like our two-day classes a little bit more advanced because we we talked about needle decompression and surgical crites and, and, and stuff like that. But so that you're going to get a little bit more of the why behind it. But those uh, those basic like IFAC items, the first aid mm-hmm. type stuff, uh, we start injecting that why because I, I, I want you to understand why you're doing it. But we really try to keep it as simple as possible so that one, it's not intimidating because I know, like you said, people think they have to have this huge amount of knowledge and you really don't. You really don't you know the body I mean, uh, be effective i mean you're right you approach it i think and again this is just my opinion but if you approach it from the, the lens of <clears throat> i just want to be more effective mm-hmm. and that first line until i mean we live in the united states right i mean we have first responders unfortunately response times are kind of shitty but we have first responders mm-hmm. we have access to great medical care and it's all over well save for a couple of remote areas of the country, right? right? It's super accessible. So you don't need to be the one that does everything. You just need to be the one that affords more time for those people to do the things that really matter. You can be effective with a little bit. Yeah. And that's the big focus, right? Is we want to, we want to introduce what a life threat is like, what's going to kill this person right now or within the next 10 minutes and how we can, how we can, help that i i don't need i don't need like i would like people to understand the entire system and how everything works because i love that stuff you know i i can i can nerd out on anatomy and physiology for a long time but if i can 
lock in like this is a life-threatening thing and this is what you need to do about it then that's a good place to start at it's um you have to kind of think of it the same as when you take a firearms course or something right if you go to the flat range and you're taught basic pistol handling you're not going to walk away from that knowing exactly what to do all the time and you're not going to be fantastic at it right so this is it's the same thing like you come you get a foundation level of knowledge um and then you can practice and train and learn on your own afterwards so, but I, it's in the classes i really want to inject that just foundational level so i don't want it to be too intimidating for anybody it's it's a very very barney style course um, a what Bar um barney style you know it's uh abc is one two three it's just the basic yeah basic stuff <laughs> that's what i thought you said no i was like yeah what? did yeah. you say that yeah <laughs> yeah big purple dinosaur got it <laughs> yeah um no i mean and i think that that approach makes sense and i i think it helps to kind of uh make things digestible for folks you know i think for for years in the in the shooting space of the community right you get these and they're still there and they have their place right but these classes that are two days, three days, four day long classes that cost you eighteen hundred dollars and you're going to bring three thousand rounds or seven thousand right. rounds, you know, and it's like, whoa, dude, I'm not like I'm not ready for that. That's like a huge financial commitment. And I don't want to walk in there and look like I don't know what the fuck's going on, even though I don't. You know, I think that this more uh, for lack of a better term, like prescriptive approach to. Uh, to teaching and and starting in a, like, fundamentals and breaking things down and addressing the like that lay person right that bottom level student if you will um, that sounds worse than I mean it too but <laughs> you know those people that really just don't know and right. there's a certain level of apprehensiveness and fear to wanting to reach out and ask you know like hey I really I want to know this stuff but I don't know where to start I think it's it's I mean and that's something that Orion does uh, right. that is just fantastic you know if you want to know the more advanced stuff we have that if you want to get there and you don't know how take this and this and that's going to help you you know what i mean um because honestly like yeah you're talking about two-day class and uh crikes and everything like i mm -mm, nope i don't want any part of that i yeah. don't i don't you <laughs> I know mean, that's the, a good mindset to have though right that's um you know there's a lot of people out there that, that'll that'll say like um you know you shouldn't really be showing non-medical people how to do surgical crites or needle decompression or anything else. And that's, it's not, it's not a point of contention. I understand where they're coming from in that. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, I, you know, they don't want, you know, just a random person trying to perform a surgical crite on the side of the road somewhere, but uh, well, and I don't, good Samaritan laws aren't going to cover you on that, but <laughs> yeah, you're, taking, the, your, you're, yeah. you're taking life in your own hands at that point. <laughs> yeah. Um, at the same time, like, I think with, with everything, you know, we're, we're not going to gatekeep any information from anybody. So like, I'm going to offer it. I'm going to offer it to civilians every time that anybody's came through those advanced classes. Uh, they pretty much say the same thing that you just did. Like, man, this is awesome information. I'm glad I was exposed to it, but I'm not comfortable like doing this to somebody. Like, That's great. As long as you understand it. And, um, you know, if, if, it's just me and you there. And I'm like, Hey man, like I have to do this thing. And and you're like, Oh cool. I know what to hand you next. Then that works out great. You know? Right. Um, right. But no, yeah. I mean, I, the gatekeeping thing that that's a, that's something we see, we see a ton on the shooting side and mm -hmm. it sounds like an unfortunate, you know, uh, counterpoint or counterpart, I should say in the medical space then too. It's like, we well, shouldn't teach people tactics. You shouldn't, you shouldn't teach them this. You shouldn't teach them that. And it's like, should we not teach it to them or has everybody done such a poor job teaching to that point? We didn't explain the, the nuance and the context around it to understand there's times when you should use this and there's times when you shouldn't. Right. And I think that that, you know, like you said, the why, I think the why is the biggest part of this. That a lot of people missed and, you know, just because somebody's good at something like you can be a great surgeon, you could be an amazing, you know, paramedic, that's you can be an amazing shooter, right? It's not going to make you a great teacher. Right. And I, I really do think that that's where things had, had been right. Falling short. And it sounds like both spaces. Now you have some more open-minded folks taking the steps going, Hey, calm down. 
it's not that we shouldn't teach people this. It's that they don't understand why they shouldn't use it sometimes. Right. And that I think is really, really pivotal. I think so. And it's the example I like to use is you can, you can go on YouTube right now and watch a video on surgical traits. Like that will go through the whole procedure. So you had to do it. Like there's, there are advanced procedures out there. Um, you can go and figure out how to remove an appendage or do a, do an appendectomy, right? Does that mean that doesn't mean that you're going to try to like perform surgery on somebody? Yeah. Um, so I would rather if people are carrying this stuff, like if if people are are sticking these needle uh, decompression needles in their kit or whatnot, like I would rather them come get an understanding of like what it's for and when to use it, than have it and have no idea or hurt somebody with it right yeah um, yeah so yeah I, I mean as with everything else i'm just not you know we're not gonna gatekeep information you know it's there's there's no point in it um again it's just a share it's sharing knowledge that's that could save somebody's life so let's just get that out there yeah no i yeah the point is you're gonna save somebody's life so i mean why not teach people this i think that yeah. there's a shared responsibility on both sides like you Absolutely. know you got to know when to use it and if you're not it, it's almost like self-defense shooting in a way where it's like if you're you need to have those critical thinking skills in place beforehand before you make those decisions um but again we don't i think we don't look at it that from that lens right with the medical skills because it's not you know where 90 percent of the focus is which is shooting right. And that's right. unfortunate, but it is starting to shift. And I, I hope it can, I think it will. I hope it continues to, to shift that way, especially because as you're trying to build the community, I think, and bring people in, you know, there is, there's room for people that don't like guns, you know, Hey, yep. hey man, it's just, I don't like firearms and never raised around it. Like, I, like I dig the whole prepping thing. I, you know, I, I dig all this stuff. I'm just not cool with firearms. Yep. Maybe it's, I'm not cool with firearms yet or mm-hmm period, whatever. But the medical piece, I think that's like, if someone's trying to fit in, like, Hey, go immerse yourself in that, man. Like you can hang out, like ain't nobody you go to the range with going to be upset. If you have like an advanced medical knowledge and the, you know, the case that something bad happens. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's cool that you, that you play through the term prep in in there too, because that's like, it's been such a shift over the past, like a few years right like we've seen from like where we have these tv shows about preppers and people are thinking they're crazy to where so the great now, toilet paper shortage of 2020 where right. everyone suddenly discovered and, that they need to have supplies everybody needs toilet paper or like and i i think you are seeing that shift to like you know people want to learn land nav they want to learn communications they want to learn they're trying to fill out this more rounded profile other than like i can shoot really fast and do like the fastest one reload one like it's it's yeah you're really starting to see people get like the whole picture of what it takes to be ready for whatever situation they find themselves in right i think uh i think that's that's part of the reason that we're seeing the push towards the medical stuff as well Well, which is awesome and also you know just like well not everything but all the stuff we saw on the on TV, right? Through that whole lockdown, summer of love and everything. Like, oh, oh yeah. when are you gonna use that? It's like, well, go ahead and turn on the TV, see a bunch of peaceful protests, people throwing bottles and rocks mm-hmm. and all tough cocktails. Like, hey, maybe uh it would be a good idea to know how to treat a burn appropriately or yeah. a laceration from a broken beer bottle or you know, like blunt force trauma from a fucking cinder block. Right. <laughs> you know, like probably could stand to learn a little bit more about that stuff and how to, you know, like you said, read and evaluate those situations to know, like, that's a major bleed. That's not so major. Maybe I should seek out more immediate medical attention for this guy over here. Like all, all stuff that took basically catastrophic situations for people to realize there's a lot of value here and, you know, take advantage. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, there's people, people have cheesy lines for everything, but like, you don't want to wait until like it is the worst day of your life to be prepared for it. Right. Um, just it, it happens. It happens all over the place. I mean, I live, you know, close to new Orleans. There's stuff that goes on all the time that like medical would be it like good for. So I think it's really a shift and, you know, we're doing a 
decent job of trying to make that accessible to everyone, like shameless plug. But we have some upcoming like online courses that yes, are uh, yeah yeah like like really affordable probably the same price as like an ifat or something right uh it's three hours and it teaches you all of those basics um you'll be able to get reps on your own obviously it's not going to be the same as like an in-person class but like it's good information for somebody to get and it's in a really accessible form for them and it's just a super cool shift to see really well, because you, you you would think that this kind of stuff would be slight, not even necessarily like, and I and I, I hesitate to call this like you know quote trauma medicine or anything like this, right? But you would think there'd be more access to first aid style classes through like the American Red Cross or your local hospital. Yeah. And I think maybe at one point in time, in history, that was probably true. Um, it seems like all you ever hear about these hospitals is like budget cuts and everything. And then they make, you know, insane profit margins, but uh, it, it, it's just, it's not that accessible, you know, short of, and then when the, the crazy part too, is like, you know, I work in finance and mm-hmm. pre COVID they, my company paid for the red cross to come in and give a free CPR certification course. So they went through, like they have the dummies teach all the mm-hmm. CPR stuff, right. They teach you how to apply a tourniquet and even gave you like this, little kit that was like a starter kit like nothing of value other than like it was a bunch of gauze that i you know threw in my kit at home so (laughs) which we already covered um but and at any given time in this building there was probably 80 people working right you know um with everyone coming in now uh hybrid working remote working whatever we had seven people sign up for the class wow and work paid for all of it and i'm like dude you get like at minimum I would think there'd be that like a handful of people that are like, I just wanted to get out of work for a little bit. Right. You know, like right. it was a two hour course or whatever. The lady was nice. She did a good job and everything. And like, I was actually surprised. There's only seven of us and one, it was actually only six of us and one person who found out about it, who drove over from another facility <laughs> because they wanted to take it. And I'm like, that's cool. But seven, you seven know, people. Like, come on. And then, you know, the first thing she asked us, she's like, all right, so I start the class this way. So we do, you know, how many of you guys know where your first aid kit is? And we're like, uh, you... I know we have one. She's like, yeah, you do. It's mandated by law. And I was like, okay, do you know where it is? I'm like, uh, looking at the lady next to me, like, Hey, you use the copy machine a lot. Is it, is it in that room? <laughs> you no. Know? And like nobody, we all had an idea, but nobody knew for sure. And then like, do we have a defibrillator? I'm like, yes, we do. Do we know where that is? Like, I, I think it's with the first aid kit. Where is it? Uh, I think it's in this. You know what I mean? Right. So it's just those things that like, like you said, you don't want to wait until the worst day of your life or one of the scariest situation. And because it, it, it doesn't have to be something crazy. It can be somebody in the office just like has a heart attack or, right. you know, something like that to, you know, know how to evaluate these situations and even just to know where to get the supplies or you know, uh, like when people found out that I carry in my messenger bag, a tourniquet, mm. like, well, what do you have that for? Like in case I need to stop bleeding, well, what right. do you think's going to happen? Like, <laughs> I mean, I sure should don't know, right. <laughs> but I, you know, I have it. And it doesn't matter if, if, if like you never use it, right? Like it's there. Mm-hmm. Like, and that, that's the thing though. I think there, there's, there's stuff out there that makes this a little bit more accessible and like you were saying i don't think it's as prevalent as it used to be i know um like stop the bleed stop the bleed's a big course if um you know a lot of times those classes are free if not they're very very cheap if you can find them near you uh take a stop the bleed course like that's 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 a great starting point for everything same with like you were saying with somebody at work having a heart attack like like that that would be the foundational medical knowledge if i was somebody with none that wanted to start learning some, I would say like a stop mm-hmm. and bleed course, like learn CPR, AD. Those are, those are the absolute basics. Um, it's or, easier to find facilities know. for that too. Yeah, you know what absolutely. I mean? Like as somebody who's trying to find a location to host, like a no fire, like CQB class mm-hmm. with Orion, it's really difficult. You know what I yep. mean? Let alone a live fire class. But if you went to, I would imagine if you went to any place that had a large enough gathering space and said, Hey, I want to host a company to come in and teach a first aid course for four hours, eight hours, whatever. 
I mean, there would be probably no shortage of places willingness to like allow you to do it. And I'm sure a lot would probably do it for free, yep. you know? Um, but again, for whatever reason, like it's just, it's not as accessible and it's not as prevalent as it should be. Um, I don't know why. I, I, I don't either. I mean, I hope, I hope it becomes more, I, I would, um, that's one of the things I, I really like about this whole online offering that we're doing is it, it gives uh, the foundation for people. There are a lot of companies out there that do do stop the bleed and stuff like that. It pretty sure you can just go on their website and, and look for courses, but otherwise, yeah, I don't see a whole lot of stuff. Even like for me, when I'm looking for like my CPR or, other courses to like keep my medic license going it, mm-hmm. it gets harder now than it has been in the past to find like courses for me to take so it's hard but hopefully like we start seeing more emergence of this so is is that what people should be looking for is stop the bleed um or because i mean i know you hear t-e-c-c and t-triple-c and right. stop the bleed and i feel like sometimes people use it interchangeably and it's I know that that's not accurate. Yeah. I mean, so TECC is a course that was derived from TCCC, right? TCCC is is the military course. Tactical it's, it's, Combat Casualty Care. Yeah, it's, yeah, Tactical Combat Casualty Care. It's managed by the Committee of Tactical Combat Casualty Care, COTSI. Um, they Like a mouthful. Yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah. Imagine having to say it like nine times during a lecture. They have, um, you know, they're the ones who regulate the information. They're the ones who recommend tourniquets. Um, those are courses offered through a national organization that works uh, mostly on the EMS side, and that's NAEMT. Uh, it's like North American Emergency Medical Training, and so they're regulated courses through that entity. Stop the Bleed is a nationwide initiative. Uh, there are different companies that that run that, um, and it's it's it was meant to be a free course, the same as like a first state or CPR course. It's meant to be it's meant to be a free course if you can find it for free. Um, that's awesome. If not, normally they are cheaper courses. So- well, I would say if there is a cost, because I think the one I found was like fifty bucks look at the description. It may come with like the supplies you need so you can show up with nothing. And that right. may be what the cost is for right. people hearing this going, Oh, well, those fuckers charge me money. Like, well, <laughs> if, they're, if they're giving you a cat tourniquet and a chest seal and a bunch of gauze to use, like, yeah, if they you're can't walking away with stuff. money. <laughs> like, like think about that for a second. Um, it is a little bit less like, so stop the bleeds and a cover how to use those things. Right. Stop the bleed covers. Like, how and when to use those when you get into like TECC or tech um, tech teaches you pretty much the same thing that TCCC does or, or TCCC. It's pretty much the same information. It's geared toward civilians. Um, so you're not going to learn like how to call in a nine line medevac or how to use like the combat pill pack that the army carries, which isn't really applicable for civilians anyway. Yeah. But everything else you learn, the difference is that like in a TECC course, you learn about like your different zones of care as far as like direct or indirect threat or cold zone, hot zone, warm zone, and what your actions should be in each of those courses. So it's, you know, we always say like, this isn't, it's a medical course, not a tactics course, but there is a little bit of like thinking involved there as far as like, okay, this is the situation that's going on. Like, do I want to stop and treat this person? Like it's like another of the lines that gets thrown around over and over and over is that, you know, sometimes good medicine is bad tactics. So like if people are actively shooting at you, it may not be the time for you to stop and (laughs) start working on somebody. Your goal is your goal at that point is to finish the fight. Right. That's like, that's the best way to stop that situation. And so it, it goes into a lot more of that side of it, plus all the stuff that Stop the Bleed teaches. Um, now, that's not to deter anybody. I wouldn't say that tech is a course. I, there's, there's, there's not like take this and then that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if Stop the Bleed is what you have available to you, near you, it is a great course to take. Um, it is definitely a good foundation of medicine. 
if you've never taken the stop to bleed though, you can still come to like a tech tech Leo class or you know, as we call it, like like our tech med class, and you're you're gonna learn the same foundation. So maybe maybe that clarifies a little bit or I just like word vomited and confused the no, situation more. But <laughs> no, I think no, that that definitely helps. Um I think it's if you think about it from the lens of you know who the class is built for rather than the content of the course. Um, and it, and it matters, right. You right. know, cause if you're not in combat, T triple C may not be the most, right. you know, applicable stuff for you, or it may be app, you know, that much plus a bunch of things you'll ever, you know, need to know. Um, so it's just, I think it's kind of the right solution to the right problem, so to speak. Yep. Um, I think so. No, and that helps. Cause I, you hear those terms, people like they're like buzzwords now, you know? So yep. it's like you say T triple C and what you meant was probably stop the bleed. Right. Uh, just like, you know, it's just one of those like kitschy, cool things that you see in the community, like strapping, uh, you know, tourniquets to your kit or everyone carries uh, trauma shears behind their mags. Mm-hmm. And it's like, all right, cool. Where's your IFAC? <laughs> and they don't have one. It's like, so what the fuck are the shears for? And it's like, uh, well, I saw it in a video, so I just threw it in here. Yeah. Like, hey, cool. Good on you, I guess. You can open your MRE a lot faster or something. Yeah, they're know. they're really good at opening Skittles. Like yeah. that's that's perfect for for it. Um no, I mean that's a good point too. People people do it. I think I think it gets used interchangeably. Um you know, classes get called all kinds of stuff. You mm-hmm. just have to kinda kinda know what that class is geared towards. Like you know, when you come to a tech med class, you're we talk about the difference between cover and concealment. We talk about, you know, um if it's a good time to do self aid versus buddy aid like if you got shot and you're behind cover over there you know i'm probably gonna say like hey put your tourniquet on like instead of running over to where you are um i've heard blade say before like hey if they got shot there then you can get shot there so oh, but i like <laughs> yeah i don't want to be there so i mean the class covers a little bit more of that stuff um would be like my what i would say was the big difference for is like stop the bleed is probably similar to what to what you took and like this is a tourniquet this is how you apply a tourniquet this is when when to apply a tourniquet uh mm-hmm. it doesn't doesn't go into a whole bunch more and then um we run a lot of scenarios so there's we we go through the class we do a lot of dry practice in a controlled environment until everybody has a decent understanding and then it's pretty much just role players and scenarios for the rest of the day and i think that's what really helps lock in those skills in real time yeah, I, I I think that that's 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 actually really cool because I think that when you start putting people in a situation where they're not just tasked with regurgitating what was just like thrown at them, but actually being forced to think the you know use the process, think through it, and get to that solution on their own. At least in my opinion, that's when you really start to retain because you just have to engage more of your brain. You know what I mean and. Uh, for all the things I know our military does well, PowerPoint is up there. Right. And I feel like a lot of people look at a PowerPoint presentation, like I can teach 80% of this this way, (laughs) but you lose people so quickly. And I, again, I work in finance. I, I, I've seen a lot of PowerPoint Yep. and I definitely don't retain most of that shit until I have to actually start doing it. Like, and that's just finance. Like no one's bleeding out next to me while I'm downloading, you know, like ACH reports and, right. and stuff like that, you know? So uh, I, I think it's good. But um, so as we're kind of wrapping this here, uh, yeah. where can people find you and information on, on your guys' classes if they, they want to sign up uh, like the online one, especially now during yeah. the holidays, three hours, I think is you know easy or Hey, you know, people are looking for a gift. That's, that's a real that's easy true. one to, buy to pay for. Buy it for somebody else. Um, all the classes that are offered through Orion are on the website. We have a website. It's, um, it seems to be confusing sometimes, but it's oriontraininggroup.com. Um, you can go on there and sign up. The two online classes are listed right now. Um, I think once this Friday, the 18th. Um, so that might be a little quick, but uh, there's another one coming up December 16th as well. Um, also in December, as far as other signups, I'm teaching with Blake through his company, uh, Maneuver Training, in North Carolina the first weekend of December. So there will be a three-day course called First Contact, um, myself and another page, um, Archangel Tat- 
SatMed are teaching a, a quick medical portion, similar to Stop the Bleed, while Blake is teaching some uh, firearm stuff, dealing with concealed carry. So it's a, it's a class about what your actions can be if, if you do get involved in a concealed carry shooting situation, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, that's, that's the uh, maneuver training. You can sign up on his site. And you can sign up on a Ryan training group. As far as my stuff, all of my stuff is on Instagram. It's on it's at nomadic dot clinician. That's pretty much it. It's a, that's everything. If you yeah. can find it. Cool, man. Well, hey, I appreciate you taking the time and walking through this. Yeah, man. Uh, like I, I just, again, I've said it a bunch already, but I really like that this is the way that the community is moving. And I think that the more we talk about this stuff and the more spotlight i guess that it gets i think it only just encourages that behavior that much more um and it's certainly something i don't i, I don't ever feel confident enough to like quote teach or tell people about I, I mean i like having good folks to refer people to so like hey you want you have medical questions here's guys to go to that that know what the hell's up like hey you want to you want to learn about shooting somebody at 700 yards like baller here go talk to right. that guy that ain't me all <laughs> that's right not me. like that's that's not my wheelhouse um so i appreciate you coming on and making the time this is all really really good stuff um and i definitely encourage anybody listening uh if you have you know questions you want to take a class look up those resources yeah that Josh is throughout and uh and get your get your learning on yeah feel free to dm me, DM me any questions i try to answer as many as i can cool man cool well hey i appreciate it and uh we're gonna be in touch man no man thanks for having me this was awesome thanks brother take care so hopefully you walk away from that conversation learning a whole bunch about your the medical kit that you have on you and if you if you didn't you know good for you hopefully that's because you've already invested the time uh in in research and training into learning these things I really do think that this is uh, a piece of the community that is rapidly growing, but I think needs more attention. And I think that everybody can do more to invest in their own preparation on the medical side. You know, Josh and I said it in that discussion a couple of times, and it it really does ring true. You're, You're more likely to use your medical training and your medical gear, your medical kit than you are your, you know, your everyday carry gun or everyday carry knife or your suppressor or your night vision. It's not as, you know, quote, not as cool, not as sexy, but uh, there's a pretty good argument to be made that saving lives is pretty cool. So hopefully, like I said, you guys learn something from that. And I, I sincerely hope that you guys go check out some of these online courses that Orion is putting together. From an accessibility standpoint, I think it's really awesome. Finding ways to get to this information is possibly the most difficult part. Uh, So putting something like this together where anybody, regardless of your geographic location, can can sign in and for, you know, three hours or whatever the length of time is, you can get this information. You can get this training. You don't have to necessarily go out and buy any kind of crazy supplies or anything like that. Uh, You know, a lot of us probably already have a lot of this stuff and it may just be expounding upon some very high level knowledge you have uh, and taking it to the next level, that's great. And hell, if you if you want to have Josh and the guys from Orion out to to run a med class, like get in touch with them. Email them through OrionTrainingGroup.com. They they teach on a lot of different subjects: CQB, Land Nav, uh, Med, Radios and Communications, all kinds of things. They really are a conglom- a conglomerate, really, of training resources. So reach out through OrionTrainingGroup.com and and try and get them out, especially if it's a medical class. You know, it's probably a lot easier to secure a facility, and the cost is generally a lot lower for entry than something with a firearms class that's a little bit higher, just due for a lot of you know overhead factors and things. I learned a bunch from Josh. I, very insightful, and he has the firsthand knowledge and experience. <clears throat> both as a teacher and an educator, but also as a paramedic and a paramedic FTO who's been out there actually doing these things, uh, experiencing these things. And, and yeah, he's a vet of the Air Force and things like that, but uh, has a lot of knowledge on the civilian side of things, which I think is really impactful and uh, important for those of us that, that want to know how this is applicable to, to our lives. 
So again, I, I hope you guys really enjoyed it. I will definitely be trying to bring Josh back on in the near future to talk more about this because med is such a deep issue. You know, you can be you can be very effective with a small amount of information. And I think we we talked about that quite a bit in this discussion, but there's just so many rabbit holes you can go down into. And I'd really like to have him back on to talk more in depth around some of those things. So stay tuned for that. Again, great guy, great discussion. Uh, Orion does outstanding work. Obviously, we've had a, a lot of their cadre on um, because they're, they're good people. They're good educators that want to share this information. That's what this podcast is about specifically is sharing information with all of you that are out there wanting to learn. You want these resources, I'm trying to bring the best folks I can that are every bit as invested in helping you learn as you are in learning yourself. So hope you did some. Uh, hope you guys had some some pretty awesome takeaways from this. Uh, I really enjoyed it, and we're gonna have uh, you know next couple of weeks here. We got some pretty cool guests lined up. Some some pretty cool things in the works as we kind of head into the uh, the holiday season. So stay tuned for more. As always, head on over to Patreon.com. Check out our Patreon page. Sign up. Support what we're doing here with the uh, Prepared Mindset. But until next time, folks. I'm Austin signing off. That's all I got for you for this week. Get out there, work hard, train smarter, and be prepared. Mm -hmm.